and cover the western half of the United States. Uh, we had a really great speaker lined up for you today, um, Dr. Megan Rolfe out of Kansas State. Uh, Dr. Rolfe is a geneticist. She sits on the board for BIF. Uh, she grew up there in Kansas. and. She's worked for Extension at Oklahoma State and then moved back up to Kansas State. Uh, she teaches classes on genetics and breeding and genetics. So <clears throat> I've been on the phone with her. She got stranded in Dallas last night. Three, I think three canceled flights, but I've been on the phone with her for 30 minutes this morning going over this presentation. Um, and so I'll try my best to get her points across that she wanted. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. And this is gonna be kind of the basics on EPDs and why we collect data. So what we'll talk about a little bit, why do we collect data? How do we collect the data for the EPDs? What EPDs are? how we use them, and which EPDs are important. And we'll just start off with why do we collect data. So phenotypic selection. So if we look at phenotype, so what the animal looks like, it's a summation of genotype and environment. So what Dr. Clear just talked about was phenotype. There's genotype, which is the genes that that animal has, plus the environment, which is anything and how it was raised, anything that can differ from place to place. So when we're looking at genotype, or phenotype, that's what the animal looks like. That includes your actual weights and your ratios. Your environment includes all of your management decisions or temporary effects. So age of dam, creep feeding, those are both environmental effects um, that go into effect that are part of this environment over here. Those are temporary. Permanent effects, Mastitis. So if you got an animal with mastitis, she's always got mastitis. That is a permanent effect on the environment that will affect the phenotype. And then genetics. Genetics are heritable. And so we'll talk a little bit about heritability and how that's passed on to the next generation. And then we'll finish up with EPDs and indexes and how we use those. So right here, if we've got, we go out and we look at two different places and have two different bull prospects and we're looking to increase our weaning weight. If I just look at the ratios on those individual operations, I'm not getting as much data as I could be if I looked at EPDs. Because say, I've, or let's take John and Sue for example out in California. They're in a completely different environment than Mr. Carr in South Texas. So you've got two completely different environments. So those ratios can be used to compare within those herds, but not across the herds because of the environmental effects. Environmental effects play a huge role in the ratios that we're looking at. So EPDs and index values are much more reliable than the actual values or the records or ratios because we use the environment. We take the environment out of EPDs. So if we look at these bars, what we've got is this gray portion of each bar. That's the genetic effect on, let's say, weaning weight. So that's the genetic effect on weaning weight. And all of these were raised in a different environment. So you can see that there's different environmental effects. So this animal one and two, extremely similar in these weaning weights, right? Very similar in weaning weight. But number two, there's, much, there's a more genetic effect. And number one, there's more of an environmental effect. So animal number one may have been fed more, and number two has more genetic propensity to gain more before weaning. Number four, you see the genetic effect is real small with a huge environmental effect. So he's been on a feed bucket the entire time, had almost perfect conditions for him, and he looks great. 
So some information that we've got, we got to record information, but some of the information we record is about like this cat on the side of the road, free cat. So who wants the free cat? The data that does absolutely nothing for us, okay? So we got to make sure that when we record that data, it's recorded properly. We have contemporary groups and things like that. So what are EPDs? So a basic overview, we'll start with a definition of what an EPD is, and that's an expected progeny difference. So it's the average difference that we expect to see between the progeny of two different animals. Uh, Dr. Clear talked about selecting for with EPDs, and that's, <coughs> We're trying to get a breeding value. It's the relative performance of those animals. And we're looking at how their progeny should perform based on genetics, based on their individual performance, based on every piece of information that we have. In that, we correct for these environmental differences. So we talked about environment. We saw how sometimes environment plays a huge role in the actual data for that animal. Well, with EPDs, what we do is we correct for that environmental difference. We even the playing field to compare animals under different management systems, and we, <clears throat> that's what we do with EPDs. So we account for the different management systems between the different contemporary groups. So you could actually have different contemporary groups within your place. So if you have four or five pastures, and you calve out in one pasture, and <clears throat> those calves all stay together, that's one contemporary group, even if it's just across the fence. So EPDs are a relative performance number, so they're not an absolute value. So with an EPD, we're not saying that our weaning weight, <laughs> EPD of 30, that doesn't really mean anything unless we're comparing. So. I like to think of it, you have to look at the last word and what an EPD, what it stands for, and that's difference. So it means absolutely nothing to look at one EPD by itself and not know anything else. You have to have at least something to compare to. So you've got sire A and sire B here with weaning weight EPDs of 30 and 40 respectively. And so what we expect right here is we expect calves out of sire B to average 10 pounds heavier at weaning than calves out of sire A. And this is on a bell curve. So you do get some of those extremes, some of those that push out towards the end of that bell curve from sire one or sire A that are gonna be heavier than some of the ones from sire B. We can also compare to percentile rankings or averages within the breed. So. Sire A has a weaning weight EPD, and that's in the top 25% of the breed. So we know that that animal is better than 75% of the animals that are in the breed. So we expect only one out of four bulls to sire calves with heavier weaning weights when bred to cows of the same basic genetic makeup. So how do we collect this data? So data collection is extremely important to calculate EPDs. It is the basis or one of the key factors in calculating EPDs. So this guy keeps saying, get all the information. We'll think of a use for it later. Well, we've got a use for it with the EPDs. So what goes into the EPDs? So the performance records of the animal itself and it's contemporary group deviations are what really matters. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then the progeny records of that animal. So when you get a bull and he has progeny or a cow that has progeny, we need to look at contemporary group deviations there. Records on correlated traits get calculated in. Performance records of the relatives. Again, that's the contemporary group deviations. The pedigree of the animal. So the original EPDs that came out decades ago started with everything except for this genomics. So they're based on Henderson's mixed model equations, which I won't get into. And then we add genomics in. So we do the genomic testing. Dr. Clear mentioned it. We had several speakers from Neogen here yesterday. Carrie White talked about how we incorporate those genomics into EPDs. So that's the final part. So what we're going to talk about now is going to be contemporary group deviations and why it's important to record all of your data. 
So first, we need to look at it. We need to compare apples with apples or oranges with oranges. So when we're comparing animals and comparing contemporary groups, they need to be the same sex, the same breed. So we're all beef master breeders. So we've all got beef master cattle. And they need to have the same type of management. So like I mentioned earlier, if you've got two different pastures, even if one's just across the fence from the other, there is a little bit of different man difference in management there. Um, so you've got different contemporary groups based on sex, breed, and management. Uh, we actually, these are from the BIF guidelines. We actually have birth and weaning weight management codes on our registration form, so make sure you put those in. Um, make sure you do proper contemporary grouping. So, we went, go back to ratios. This is all on the same ranch, and we're going to go with gray is genetic, and purple is environment. And here we see every single one of these purple blocks is the same size. And so we can see within our own herd, within our operation, this animal number two and seven and one and five, those are kind of our three in terms of if we're looking at weaning weights, those would be our three biggest weaning weights due to their genetics. But we can only compare this within our own herd because like we saw earlier, this environmental effect changes from herd to herd. And the last thing, and I've preached this, and everybody's heard me say it, and so maybe somebody else putting it in their slides, I did not alter these slides at all, will get you to record data on all of your animals so that we have unbiased information. So if we're looking at a weaning weight contemporary group, we've got weights that range from 524 pounds, adjusted 205 day weight, all the way up to 742 pounds. So if we look at this on a ratio, or a difference basis, so here's the difference from the average. 101 pounds for the lightest to 117 pounds for the heaviest. And so here's your ratios over here from an 84 up to 119 on the ratio. So say we cull and we don't record this data. And we cull out anything that's under 639 pounds. Well, all of a sudden, we've got three animals right here that were above average in the original contemporary group that are now below average. So it's extremely important to make sure that we have all of this data that's missing right here so that everything is accurately reflected and we get a good genetic estimate or a good estimate of what is there genetically. So going back to this same chart, we've got bull two here, who's genetics for give him 60 pounds extra on weaning weight. And bull one, 50 pounds extra. And you can see there's a huge difference based on environment, going back to that same chart. So we need to make sure we record all of our data and make sure our contemporary groups are made correctly. How do we use EPDs? So this is one of the biggest questions. One of the things that I think is probably the most confusing is how to utilize EPDs and how to utilize them correctly. Um, they're a comparison tool, like I said earlier. They're comparison. They're not used as an actual value. So you can't get an actual value from an EPD. We can't say that a birth weight EPD of a negative 1.1 is a 65 pound birth weight. We can't say that. We have to compare two animals or compare to a breed average, look at percentiles, look at some accuracy, and also one of the big things is we have to have a breeding plan. We have to have some sort of breeding objective in order to properly use our EPDs. Because I'm not going to use EPDs the same way for a diff two completely different objectives and where I want my cow herd to go. 
So if we look, these are our current breed averages for non-parents. So non-parent animals, those animals are animals that do not have progeny recorded. So these are all the young animals. So when you go to these bull sales, most of these are non-parent animals at these big bull sales. And so and this is where I would look to come get averages to compare against. So if we're looking for, say we're looking for a bull that has a weaning weight above average, well there's, there's your average weaning weight, 23.22. Say we need to improve on something in ribeye area, your average is 0.169 or 0.17. So we need to look there. And this is all available on our website. This is directly off the website. So if you go to Purebred Programs Genetic Evaluation, in the top right-hand side of that genetic evaluation page, there is a green box that has PDFs with all of these averages. These non-parent averages, averages for active dams, and also averages for active sires. Um, all of that is up there to look at. We can also, we talked a little bit about animals that were in the top 25% of the breed for something. So, if we want to look at an animal that's in the top 25% of the breed for birth weight, we need an animal that's got a negative 0.3 for birth weight, if this is a non-parent animal. So, this isn't active sires or active dams, but non-parents again. Uh, if we're looking to increase weaning weight and do that by choosing something in the top 25%, 29.15, so that means that animal, on average, his calves, if we're looking at a bull, on average his calves will be heavy, heavier than 75% of the other bulls in the breed, on average. So my favorite way to look at EPDs, personally, is with this table right here, this percentile table. Um, it allows you to select without ex selecting for extremes in any direction and without having to go back and say, well, I got bull one, bull two, bull three, bull four, bull five, and selecting each individual bull. This percentile table is probably my favorite way to select bulls. <laughs> and again, non-parent animals don't have any progeny recorded in the system. So this is just one that she'd pulled off. An animal, this animal's got the genomics logo right here. So this animal has been genomically tested, has genomic enhanced EPDs. So that's one of the things that went into EPDs that I talked about earlier was the genomics. And so we've got that. We can look at the EPDs right here. So his actual EPD for calving ease, 5.9. Birth weight, negative 1.4. Weaning weight, 32.5. And then under each of those, we have an accuracy. So accuracy of 0.26 on calving ease, 0.55, 0.52, 0 0.51 on birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight, respectively. And that is because this animal has been genomically tested. Another way, and I know a lot of y'all like this way, to look at EPDs is to look at this chart right down here. And this chart, if it goes to the right, it's above breed average. If it goes to the left, it's below breed average. Uh, so, and it also tells you what percentile this bull ranks in in each of these. So, how do we start getting EPDs and getting, so that's what you get originally. So when you get that paper and it says PE, that's a pedigree estimate. And what that is, is half of the EPD of the sire and half of the EPD of the dam. Simple calculation. You use the EPD or the breeding, breeding or mating tool on the website. It's a lot faster than you could do it, but that's all it's doing is it's taking half the EPD of the sire and half the EPD of the dam. The next thing we have, incorporates Mendelian sampling effect, which I won't go into, that's basically just deviations within the contemporary group. And we add that to the pedigree estimate, so half the EPD of the sire, half the EPD of the dam, plus that Mendelian sampling effect. And that <clears throat> gives us what we call our interims. Those interims are a higher accuracy 
than just these pedigree-based estimates, okay? Interim EPDs, we've got them now on all traits that have an individual uh, phenotype recorded on them, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, ribeye area, fat, and IMF, all have interim calculations. So if you enter data between runs, between genetic runs, you will get an interim calculation on the traits that have not already been previously recorded and run in that, in that run before. So, so if we look at this animal right here, we got sire's weaning weight accuracy of 30, dam of 20, so half of 30 is 15, half of 20 is 10. Our pedigree estimate for this animal would be 25, 25 pounds. So all calves out of this mating, so if you do a flush, and you get a pedigree estimate on these animals, all of them with just a pedigree estimate are gonna come out to 25. When we start recording weaning weights, that's where we get our contemporary group deviation and where we start seeing a change in those EPDs. And that's where that Mendelian sampling effect comes in. So now each animal gets the recorded weaning weight and we have information so those animals will go up or down based on that. So say you've got one that's below breed average, well his, his interim will drop below 25. We've got one that's above breed average, his interim will come up above 25. So now we'll talk a little bit about accuracies of these EPDs. So this animal has been genomically tested. And we'll assume right now that the genomics are all that's affecting this accuracy. Genomics will give you about a calf crop worth of data um, to, in terms of accuracy on these bulls. So genomics will give you about a calf's crop worth of data in terms of accuracy. So if we look at a possible, we have possible change values based on that accuracy, which if you go back to statistics and you think about a bell curve and you think about your standard deviations, everything fall, or 68% of those animals will fall between one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. And then you move on out. So we've got this animal 32.5 with a 0.5 accuracy. So we've got a possible change value of weaning weight of 6.7 pounds. So the true EPD of this animal will lie somewhere between 25.7 pounds and 39.3 pounds. As we get more data on that animal and how that animal's calves perform, that EPD will go up and stay between those, typically stay between those two values. So if we go with a 95% confidence interval, which goes one stand, or two standard deviations below to two standard deviations above, well then 18.9 to 46.1 is where that animal's true EPD could be. So now we got another bull here that has a 0.94 accuracy. So we're not gonna see near as much change. So there's the first bull, here's the second bull. 95% accuracy, 0.67. So you're really only gonna see about a change of a pound up or down from where the EPD is right now on that bull, on that animal. And the same thing if we go to a 95% confidence interval. So here's the range right here. First bull that we compared, here's his actual EPD. His high could be up around 40, his low could be down around 25. Still not a huge, huge spread in terms of what we got there. And then here's the change that we could see for bull two. So much smaller change. We have a lot more data, a lot more information on this bull to be able to more accurately predict how he will uh, work out genetically. So accuracy increases with more data. So as we add more individual performance, as we add more relatives, as we add more progeny, uh, as we add genomics, accuracy will increase on these EPDs. 
So it's really a risk management tool is what accuracy is. So we look, <coughs> this is a high accuracy bull and a low accuracy bull. So we look at that and we can really say, okay, I need to do some high accuracy bulls to really increase a weaning weight. They've both got the same average or the same EPD right now, but big difference in possible change values because of accuracy. So we really need to, you know, if you're looking for a herd sire, maybe use that higher accuracy bull that's got a lot of progeny in terms of, or not a herd sire, an AI sire. Now, EPDs, EPDs are better estimates for performance, regardless of accuracy, than what we can get from an individual performance because of all of the data that is taken into account. It takes into account phenotypes on every animal that's in the system, the pedigree of every animal in the system, and the genomics of every animal that has recorded genomics in the system. So EPDs, because of the amount of data that goes in, are always better estimates and better ways to pick than individual performance. So which EPDs are important? What, what determines what EPDs are important? There's a bunch of EPDs. We have 11 traits that are measured with EPDs. Which of these is important for you? You have to have a breeding objective. You have to know your environment. Selecting for the extreme EPDs and selecting way up at the top is not always the best. If I've got a harsh environment like this, I don't want to select for a high milk EPD. I need a bull that's going to have a lower milk EPD, more towards average or a little bit below average to make my cows more efficient. Um, if I'm in lush, lush areas, may select for a little bit more growth. There's a little bit more propensity for that animal to grow and have more capacity for growth. So it all depends, and it also depends on your production system. Am I selecting for females, or am I selecting for a terminal cross? Dr. Clear mentioned terminal cross animals and maternal animals. What am I selecting for? That's gonna determine what I need to use EPD, EPDs for. So, this is probably one of the most important parts of this presentation right here. You need to have breeding objectives. Uh, Dusty's actually put out a video with Dr. Spangler from the University of Nebraska, and he talked about breeding objectives and why they're important. So how do we start a breeding objective? It's just like any business plan. You have to have a mission statement that defines your direction. So where am I going? What do I want to produce? Um, and so the most important things to look at, what do we do well? So what do beef masters do well? We're known as a maternal breed. We know that our commercial bull customers are coming to us because they get maternal cross females from us. What do we need to improve on? So one of the things that's been pointed out to us as a breed that we need to improve on may be a little bit of carcass. How much do we need to improve on it? How much do we need to push on it? Where can I increase profit? That's a big thing. Cattle is a business, right? We're in here, it's a business. Maybe not our main business, but it is a business. So we need to try to think, how can we make more profit for ourselves? And how can we make more profit for our consumers? Now are we doing terminal? We're gonna sell every calf through the, through the sale barn or retain ownership on it, not keep any heifers? Or am I gonna keep some replacement heifers? My breeding objectives are different there. If I want to keep replacement heifers, I'm going to place some different emphasis on some different EPDs. Look at what inputs are available to fit your environment. So, you know, if forage is limiting for you, you may want to drop back on some of your EPDs and not push for those extremes. Um, you know, if you've got an abundance of forage and an abundance of feed, you may want to go for the extreme and push as hard as you can to get them to grow. It all depends. So how are we going to use EPDs? How They're in a toolbox. So Dr. Clear talked about the toolbox. He talked about the phenotypic tools that we had. He talked about structural correctness, which we cannot overlook. We cannot overlook that structural correctness or the ability of that animal to go out and work. 
If it's not structurally correct, but has great EPDs, it's probably about like me right now. I can't walk around real good because I'm not real structurally correct. So I'm not going to go out and work very hard. So we've got to make sure we utilize EPDs as a tool. You're not going to build a house with just a hammer. You're not going to build a house with just a saw. You've got to have a variety of tools. EPDs are one of those tools. Um, they're a big part of it. I liked what Dr. Clear said. I do the same thing as him. I go and I look at the EPDs that are important for what I want to do, and then I go look at the animals because I'm the same way. I love numbers. I love the EPDs. I love the statistics. And you all hear me preach numbers and statistics and EPDs to you all the time. But when I go out and look at cattle, the first one that catches my eye is the best looking animal that there is. And it may not have the best EPDs. So it's, I like to go through, look at the EPDs first and see where I want to go and then pick the best that's there. We do have two indexes. I've talked about these multiple times. The terminal index. Basically, the terminal index is if you're going to retain ownership on a set of cattle and go through the feed yard all the way to the rail with these cattle. It combines weaning weight, yearling weight, ribeye area, and IMF. And basically gets us the best carcass value we can because the values, the economic values, are based on a 10-year average. Um, <laughs> Sire A and Sire B, we'll look at those two. Sire A, $110 T, and Sire B, 53. Sire A, 110 minus 53. You got a $57 a head difference between the progeny of the two sires. So say we get 20 calves out of those animals. We get an average of $57 a head more on Sire A, and that's year after year after year if we're selling those cattle through or retaining ownership on those cattle. I'd say that's a pretty 20 calves a year for four years. So 80 calves at least on Sire A. You're making a pretty big difference in your pocketbook right there. Maternal index. This is the one I kind of like to push. We talk about how maternal we are as a breed. So we've got the maternal index that's used to help ranchers select animals that fit maternal criteria. And it, Dr. Matt Spangler created these two indexes for us based on economic values. Uh, so if we look at two animals, Sire A, dollar M of 19.4, dollar uh, Sire B, dollar M of 8.29. Take the difference there, 11.17, an additional profit from the daughters of Sire A. That doesn't sound big at all, that $11.7 difference. But if we keep in mind that the cow's gonna stay in the herd 10 years, that's an additional $110 that that cow is gonna bring us. And if we keep daughters out of her in that bull, we're gonna increase that value even more. These, these two indexes are both designed to be very robust, so they can a variety, there's a wide range of application for them. But make sure you do utilize, if you're keeping replacement heifers, dollar M. If, you're keeping, if you want to sell everything, dollar T is where to look. Um, so these two indexes are balanced with the EPDs, or EPDs are used to create these two indexes. So again, when you're looking to select sires, set your goals. Look at your cow herd. Where do you need to improve on your cow herd? Say I've got a bunch of cows, and I don't have any weaning weight in my cows. I wean off a bunch of lightweight calves. I should probably look at increasing my weaning weights. Look at using a bull with a bigger weaning weight EPD. Look at your resources that you have, again. Your resources can help determine where you need to select. Breed, sele whoop. Breed selection, we're all gonna use beef master bulls. Um, when you're looking at a bull, look at, do a BSE on him. Look at his structure. Make sure he's structurally sound. Make sure he has good performance. And again, do a visual appraisal. Does that bull meet your visual appraisal needs? Here's a source right down here. 
it's a good source, especially for commercial producers, on selecting bulls. Another source, a really good source, has extension from several states involved in it, puts out very, very useful inf information, is this ebeef.org. Uh, go look at it. Um, I'd recommend them, highly recommend them. Um, so Megan is involved in that, Dr. Spangler's involved in that, Dr. Jared Decker from Missouri, Bob Weber, also from Kansas State, Dare Bullock, I believe, is involved from Kentucky. So really, really good resource. A bunch of genetic resources. Beefreproduction.org, another place to go look for some information. And with that, I'll wrap up. I probably wasn't as entertaining as Megan would have been, but um, we, I'll entertain any questions. And I'm going to push one thing. Those resources right there, e-beef, beef reproduction, uh, extension. Look to your extension agents for help as well. We're always here as a breed association to help. And there are other, multiple other resources though. Extension, your tax dollars go to pay for those publications that come out of Extension. Read those publications, talk to your Extension agent. Your Extension agent can really help you out in your area. There's beef specialists across the state that can help you out in whatever state you're in. Um, so look at all of that. So any questions? Yes. So calving ease is a combination of that calving ease score that you put down and birth weight. So the calving ease scores that are listed of, I think it's one through five, and then birth weight, EPD, because calving ease is highly affected by birth weight. They're highly correlated traits. Well, then it's on assisted pull. <laughs> It's unassisted, yeah. That, not yet. So dollar M is something that we are working on. It's a kind of a work in progress. This June at the board meetings, the, beef, uh, the Breed Improvement Committee talked about incorporating some new EPDs. Um, two of those are true fertility EPDs, an age at first calving EPD, as well as a stability EPD, and also working on a mature cow weight EPD. With those three EPDs, we'll probably include calving ease. We'll do another economic analysis with, with a university professor um, and reformulate dollar M, and it'll probably include calving ease. Well, birth weight is included in dollar M. Calving ease is not. Birth weight is. Lance, you just mentioned we're going to do a mature cow weight EPD. This might be your task to tell everybody that's why we want to weigh their calves. Yes, so we will, we're working on a mature cow weight EPD. We're about 700 records away from having enough data to calculate that. When you wean your calves and you got the cows up in the pen right behind them, run those cows across the scale as well as running those calves across the scale. Get a weight on those cows and get a body condition score on those cows. That'll give us a mature, or allow us to adjust, make adjustments, get a mature cow weight, and put that into the calculation for a mature cow weight EPD, which will tie into cow efficiency. Mr. Carr. So you've turned in weaning weights and birth weights and yearling weights on them, correct? And it was turned in between runs, and so they got interim EPDs for those weights. And when those interim EPDs go in for those weights, it also affects the index, because those indexes are affected by the individual EPDs. And so those interim EPDs also affect the index. So if you've got, you've got flush mates, and you've got one that at weaning, 
was 50 pounds heavier than the other one. His weaning weight, interim EPD, went up. The other one went down. So his dollar M and dollar T both went up, and the other one's dollar M and dollar T both went down. Well, you took out the environment because they're in that same contemporary group. You took out the environment because they're in the same contemporary group. So the genetics, if it was me giving this presentation, I'd put a picture of me and my sister up there because there's one good looking one and then there's me. <laughs> we, we look similar, but there's quite a bit of difference in us. They're in the same contemporary group. But they're in the same, con so it's the same cow type, so they're in the same contemporary group. So on your recips, as long as they're the same type of cow, it's the same contemporary group. But one of your purebreds milks better than the other one. It's an environmental effect and it gets taken out. Yeah, it does, because that animal's genetic propensity is expressed within that contemporary group. You've, you've got to work on both. What you really need to do as a purebred breeder is determine on your cow base on, say you've got a set of cows, Larry, that lacks in one area. That's where we need to focus on improving without going the other way with any other, any other traits. So we can't single trait select. Uh, the maternal index and the terminal index, if you're not comfortable with yourself not single trait selecting are a really good way to not single trait select. So if you look for one, say I'm looking for an animal and I'm gonna say I want it in the top 35% of both or top 25% of both dollar T and dollar M and I really force myself not to single trait select there. Yes. I would put the calving ease and the birth weight on everything, yes. I would record all the data because it's extremely important all the way through.